that's what it's all about when we realize that, I mean, I've actually gone into groups and I'll say a statement of fact for me is that I don't have any opinions about anything. In fact, people all the time are asking me opinions about politics or the environment or all these things. I tell them I don't have any opinions and they say, well, how can you live? How practically can you even live in this world? Well, that's where guidance comes in. <laughs> I mean, if you've got to have something to take the place of the opinions. And that's where your intuition, your inner listening comes in. It takes over. And it's so beautiful. Because that way you don't have to get into debates uh, with anybody. You're not trying to make a point. You're not trying to be right. You're not trying to convince somebody of something. You're not trying to convert somebody. What a beautiful world. We were talking about that last night at dinner. When you're not trying to convert anybody. Uh, how happy are you to just be there and feel the love and the connection that's there? Yeah. So I think I think we're are we zooming, Bill? Are we getting close to chicken time? <laughs> Ten more minutes. Okay, we're close to. We have some beautiful music if you want to listen to a couple of songs before we finish the night. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All this gospel music, huh? Oh, God, there was some Yeah, I think so. Okay. But what, do we have any other topics you'd like to explore? I mean, we just went into a big one called Living in the Present Moment. <laughs> so it's, t it's going. That's been deeper. around for a long time, guys. Sure you know, Remdes? Yes. Remdes. Be here now. That's right. Yes, yes. <laughs> By that. It's interesting, I just saw a film of Ram Das in his later years, Ram Das. Oh, Ram Das, oh, And yes. uh, it was called, uh, it, it encouraged it. Uh, it's American, isn't it? Yeah. He's and, alive. He's yes. Busy. He had a stroke mm. in 1997. Oh, oh. And this is what he described in the movie. Here he is, he's, he's laughing. Now he's in, he's in his wheelchair and he's, he's laughing and he's going, here I was in 1997. He decides, describes himself as Mr. Spiritual. Because <laughs> he's written all these books and he's gone to India and ashrams and oh, his whole life was dedicated to talking about meditation and spirituality. So in 1997, he said, here I am, Mr. Spiritual. And he starts to have a stroke. And as he's having the stroke, he's just looking up at the, the ceiling and he noticed in his mind while he's having a stroke that he wasn't having one thought about God. Uh, not one that he goes, oh my God, here it is, Mr. Spiritual, uh, facing uh, death without one spiritual thought in his mind. You know what he said? He said, that was the most humbling moment of my life. From that point on, he dedicated, that was 1997, he dedicated himself to going even deeper inside, to facing all of his expectations. Uh, he had just bought a brand new car and when he had the stroke he couldn't drive the car. And he had to face the limits. He always prided himself at, at taking care of others. And he couldn't stand the thought of, of being taken care of and receiving. And all those years since 1997 have given him many, many opportunities to see that giving and receiving are the same. That it is such a blessing. So. That's what I would say, the ultimate of this whole journey is you start to become very humble. It's a very humbling journey. The more that you go inward, the more you see how little that you know. And it just keeps getting more and more profound until you get to a point where you you release opinions. You just release all the opinions of attempting to say something. And he was obviously ready for the next level in circumstances. Yes. Yes. I think the saying, if any man be in Christ, he is a new preacher, which comes out of the Bible, is very fitting in that situation. Yes. Because her whole attitude changes. Uh, all the things are gone. You're a new preacher. <laughs> Born again, that's the, that's the deeper meaning of being born again. Not professing belief in Jesus Christ the man or a belief system, but, but when the Bible talks about a renewing of your mind in the, in the New Testament, it, it really means that, renewing of your mind. It means returning your mind to that state of innocence, 
to that state of grace that is prior to time. Because we're also used to thinking of the present moment as in between the past and the future. But it's prior. It's pristine. It's untouched. It's prior to all this time stuff. You see it in the Dalai Lama's face, don't you? Yeah, twinkling eyes. Yeah. And the way he laughs is just fantastic. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Are you are you on Randas still? Uh, no, he was just an example we were talking. Yeah. Uh, he is. Uh, he has survived his stroke. He's yes. still alive. Yes. What about being and doing? Being and doing. She's asking the question about being and doing. Well, to believe in the ego is to believe in the body and, and to believe in the busyness <laughs> and, and, and lack, which is where the doing arises in this world. Run here, we were talking about that, you and I at lunch. But we still have to work for our keep, don't we? We still have to, um, still have to do it. Yeah. 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 Yes. In terms of doing, uh, you might say, there is a, a very famous book uh, from the, the Sufi, Sufi mystic, uh, Khalil Gibran, uh, the prophet. And he says, in a title on work, he says, when you work, work with love. Uh, St. Augustine, a very famous Christian mystic saint, said, love and do what you will. In other words, we have, to, we have to be very clear about our motivation, because as long as we're confused about our motivation, then we can get into a lot of ego distractions. Even people that get into service, trying to be service to others, can get burned out if they're following the ego. Because they feel like they're sacrificing something. They feel like, oh, I'm doing all this for others, but this isn't really for me. But if you're truly in the spirit, what you're doing is for everyone, including yourself. So I know even with The Course in Miracles, I've had friends who, who tell me, oh, I went into the prison systems, I've traveled, I went everywhere, but I'm burned out. And whenever you get burned out, then it's a humbling moment to start to come back and say, hmm, is that because they're trying to change the world? Mm -hmm. Still a, a subtle yeah. thing of yeah. trying to so, save, change the world yeah. or save the world. Uh, okay. Because it's in your mind. What, you, what, you, what you're trying to fix out there is something that's unhealed in yourself. You're constantly looking for it and trying to save it out there. I mean, you're never going to do it. It's not out there. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask you one question? I have come across uh, uh, writings uh, where the one thing came out and that was that people said, I mean, very, very mature, very old, old souls, probably ready to not have to reincarnate anymore, you know, really going into liberation. Mm -hmm. And they said all the time, and it came from English literature, I got all my, uh, I, I had to give my thanks somewhere because that is the enormous gift I received from the, I can't say it in any other way, from the British side of the whatever, whoever, they are not angels, I know that, but it has lifted me because I lost the contact with spirit and that was in Europe because, mm, mm, you know, where it was very regimented and so on, that it was the era. And um, especially in, in um, the Germanic sort of, you know. Mm, mm. So I was, um, and then I came to England. And it was all that was lifted. I, oh, I met people, they, they said something, say. And it came from deep inside, and I, oh, I said, oh, hold on, you said something. I've never heard that, please. I repeated, and she said, what, what, what? And then I said, oh, I repeated for you then, you know. <coughs> oh, and then I said, why, why did you, what made you say? Well, I don't know, I haven't got a clue. And then I said, this is not possible that they come up with such, deep truth and then they say that their mind hasn't hasn't 
gone a long visit or, or doesn't isn't worried or you know and then but it does come up in the English literature as truly as I'm sitting here because I had American literature I had Canadian I had South Africa you name it wherever there had been British uh, it's just, now a mixture, yeah. mind you, but yeah. never mind. Let me put it in more of a context, in the sense that... But that has of, given me yeah. so much. Yeah, it's a reflection. That, it's like you were ready, and it, it was reflected. But what I would say in terms of cultures, for example, that this world is backwards and upside down. Oh, so please, we I have can... things like, I would say, we call industrialized nations, and what the world calls civilized nations, and then we have cultures like the Aborigines over there in, mm. in Australia. Mm. Uh, at many, in many cases, very telepathic, what yeah. the world would judge as very primitive. Yeah. But again, yeah. since everything is backwards and upside down, yeah. or in this book, and the series of light, yeah. I mean, you had in Europe a, a group of beings that would sit still in the silence okay. yes. and heal the world yeah. through their nurturing stillness. Yes. Now, my journey has taken me to all these different countries and the sneaky thing about the ego is is that the ego invents a lot of rules and regulations and rituals in this world that are designed to minimize fear. Why do we have traffic signals? Why do we have prisons? Why do we have uh, regulations and judges and so forth? It's, it's to hold down fear. In other words, the, people, the belief is if we didn't have all these rules, uh, the world would really be chaos. You think it's chaos now without some rules and structures. Yeah. But what I've noticed as I've traveled around the world is I've actually gone in some cultures in South America where they don't, they don't have such rules and regulations. For example, in Buenos Aires, it's a city of over 15 million people. Oh. 15 million, more than that, and they don't have stop signs. They don't have no stop signs. No stop signs in Buenos Aires. Now imagine, practically speaking, if you were living in a city of 15 million people with how many intersections? Millions of intersections and no stop signs. Now what does this do? Well, what you would have to do is you would soon have to be what? Very telepathic uh, if you were a cab driver. And imagine down there, because the economy has collapsed, they tried, they didn't hold hold their currency contingent with the dollar and with other currencies, so their whole economy completely collapsed. And doctors and lawyers and teachers and professionals had to take up jobs like cab drivers. Uh, because, but it actually was an advance in their career to go from doctor to cab driver. Because you have to be telepathic in that place and you have to tune into the intuition. You see how backwards it is? And the cab driver, I had one cab driver who was so happy and peaceful that I was doing the Course in Miracles gatherings. His name was Juan. I said to Juan, would you come in and speak at the Course in Miracles gathering? I asked the cab driver to come in and speak. And he said, yes, I would be glad. And he went in and he, he was very calm. He told a parable of detachment. The cab driver did. Now, what I'm saying is, is when we talk about civilizations and rules and regulations, it's kind of like the same topic of insurance, that you have to start to become more and more intuitive and get in touch with divine laws in your mind. And to do that, you will have to release these other ones. We've all been raised with the laws of nutrition, the laws of medicine, the laws of economics. Some of them, we know these laws like the back of our hands. We can tell you all about the body and nutrition and this and that. You know what? It's not going to get you into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, because guess who made all these laws up? The ego. The ego made them all up. And what's going to get you out of it is your intuition. Because 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, it's not what you put in your mouth that defiles. He was, uh, he was beginning to undo the laws of nutrition 2,000 years ago. It's your thoughts. It's your thinking without grievances and judgments, that's where your, your health starts, with mental health. And, and you know what he says in the Course? He says, all illness is mental illness. So if you follow him, what he's saying is, your, your health starts and ends with your thinking. It starts and ends. 
So all I've done in my life is I've been very honest and I started to question all those laws of nutrition, of economics, of medicine, exercise. I was trained in the laws of exercise. <coughs> what happens if you don't exercise? What happens to muscles if you don't exercise? They're, we're told they waste away. We're told we they to atrophy. But what I find, I had been a professional tennis instructor. I went to the gym. I did cardiovascular fitness and this and this. I'll tell you right now, what's for me then the turnaround is the shift in my thinking. You know, I had to learn, even when I was going to the gymnasium, to have holy encounters and to start to perceive my brother as myself instead of focusing on their body. I had to learn a different way. Soul. Soul, yes. Soul. What, if, what if your body's completely broken? Take, take my free props. Where your body has completely a, a problem that seemingly can't be fixed, what do you do with that? If you want to be able to get up and walk again or whatever, is that still up here? Well, that's where you, again, you would start and you would end with my training. In other words, it doesn't matter whether you seem to be in a wheelchair or not in a wheelchair, you still, your mind goes with you wherever you go. And what you could say is, your mind training is something, when we talk about releasing your mind from judgments, uh, I could tell you so many stories. Uh, I'll tell you one story of, of meeting a man in uh, Argentina who was a paraplegic. And it was, I was meeting with a psychiatrist in uh, Argentina, and. And he finally, we were having lunch, and he said, David, would you like to meet my teacher? And I said, yes, take me to your teacher. So we went down by this big river, and there was a man who was about 26 years old sitting in a wheelchair. And the psychiatrist, who was probably about 55, 60, a very famous psychiatrist down there, introduced the man in the wheelchair and said, here is my teacher. He has taught me more about life and love and forgiveness than anyone uh, that I've ever met. And then I sat, sat down and, and the man who was in the wheelchair and I sat there and we gazed at each other and, and I said to him, tell me your story. Tell me your story. You seem very happy. And he said that he had been able to walk and he was able to walk and move around but um, when he was about 2001, he was diagnosed with a tumor on his spine and he was told that he would have to go in for an operation that was very risky and that he may not walk after the operation. So he went under anesthesia on September 11th of 2001. And he went under anesthesia, uh, which what would have been in the early morning hours of the United States, and he went under anesthesia. And while he was under anesthesia, they operated on the tumor. And when he woke up, he had no use of his legs, and he was in such a state of ecstasy, and such a state of oneness and happiness, that the doctors and nurses tried to tell him, uh, while you are under anesthesia, a terrible, terrible tragedy uh, has occurred in the United States. Terrible tragedy. And he, he, did, he could not comprehend uh, what they were trying to tell him. He told me, from his wheelchair, that he went through that experience when he was under anesthesia, where it seemed like his ego was operated on <laughs> instead of the tumor. He said, I don't know what happened, whether I was in a deep state of prayer or whatever, but he woke up and he said his personality self, his, his pride, his jealousy, his envy and everything had been lifted and he woke up in a state of ecstasy and his legs didn't work. So it, this is quite an interesting uh, parable because he ended up becoming a teacher to many people in Buenos Aires that would come to him for spiritual uh, training and counseling. And yet his spiritual career didn't, didn't uh, actually begin until he seemed to lose his life. Now, again, if everything is backwards and upside down in this world, People ask me all the time about teaching, and I say, 
we really don't teach with our words. Uh, we're used to thinking about that. We teach with our attitude. It's our attitude that is the teacher. This young man, you know, people would say, well, at least he could walk before uh, he had this experience. I say, what do you mean, at least he could walk? Uh, his attitude is what's doing the teaching. And then, if it's part of the script, you know, how I say the script is written, there, there are those, you could say, miracles where, like with Jesus, the blind could see, the lame could walk, uh, those with palsy, with, you know, leprosy, and so on and so forth. But, but that's basically what I call symptom removal. And I've worked with people over the years where we've had miracles like that, which you call symptom removal. But in the end, what Jesus is saying with the Course of Miracles is, we're not trying to heal the bodies. We're trying to heal the mind. And the, the whole point of this whole journey is to wake up to the Kingdom of Heaven, to wake up from the dream through non-judgment. And you see how different that is. And that's why Jesus would say, tell no man, when there was even healings in his day. Why would Jesus Christ, of all people, say, tell no man, which he says in the Bible, except maybe his purpose was a higher purpose, to teach people, my kingdom of heaven is not of this world. I am calling you out of the world to a higher calling. So it, what this does is it gives us a context, not to put so much importance on the body. In fact, I would go so far as to say that the only purpose of the body is communication. And you can communicate love in many different ways. Uh, the ego thinks that the body is for things like walking and dancing. The ego thinks the body is for things like sex, uh, for competition, sports. Uh, you know, they tell me that New Zealand is the country of extreme sports. <laughs> People diving off cliffs and paragliding and bungee jumping and this and that. But when you get to A Course in Miracles, Jesus clearly, and in no uncertain terms, says that the body only has one use. Just one. And that's communication. It's, it's a device to extend love. And so that that's a, a pretty radical teaching when you think about it. Yeah. Okay.